And of course, we're talking about excuses for uh, not serving the Lord. And you know, what I want to do, and I can't do this all in one sermon, so I'm just going to do a, a short portion of it tonight, and then we're going to maybe uh, continue next week, or maybe even the third week, because really what I want to do is to help some people remove uh, the excuses that they have for maybe not serving the Lord as diligently as they should. And we begin with the, the classic uh, example found in Luke chapter 14. Uh, because you see, excuses are not just a problem in our day. Excuses have always been a problem. And, and so we have some people here who uh, have been invited by the Lord and they just are not ready to serve. Now, in the first part of Luke chapter 14, the Lord has been talking about a great feast and, and he talks about how the, the, uh, the, the, it's a wedding feast and, and, and people uh, uh, are, are jockeying for positions of honor and wanted to be seated in, uh, in the area where the most important people sit, sit and all that. And so he finishes this parable in uh, ch verse 14 of chapter 14 of Luke. And uh, there was a man listening to this parable who said this in verse 15. When one of those at the table with him heard this, he said to Jesus, Blessed is the man who will eat at the feast in the kingdom of God. Now, it's very common, especially in that day and time, for people to think of heaven as a feast. And he's not talking, uh, although it, would, it does no harm to the text if he was thinking about the church. But more than likely, this man doesn't understand the church. He's thinking about life after this life, and he's thinking of it as a banquet. A feast, a wonderful, wonderful occasion. Now that's how he senses that heaven is going to be. And so the Lord hears this man's comment, and he replies in verse 16. He says, a certain man, and of course that man is God, uh, and when you apply it to the, to the spiritual meaning, a certain man was preparing a great banquet and invited many guests. Now history says that uh, the custom was to accept or reject an invitation not knowing when the day of the banquet would be. You would you accept the invitation in advance. And it was a great insult to accept an invitation and then not show up. And so he says that uh, this, this, this man who represents God uh, plans a feast and he invites many guests. Verse 17. At the time of the banquet, he sent his servants... Uh, to, to tell those who had been invited to come for everything is ready. Now those servants there uh, represent the Jews who uh, were, were first invited to come to the feast. But they all alike began to make excuses. And really they were making false excuses, okay? Because who buys land without ever even going to look at it? Buying land sight unseen. Who, uh, who buys oxen, uh, five yoke or ten oxen, without knowing already if they will work or not? That's kind of like, uh, let's say you buy an expensive um, a truck, and you don't even know if it'll start. You don't even know if it'll run. You don't even know if it ha has an engine in it. You wouldn't do that. But they're making excuses like, oh, we don't, I don't even know if the, who, who is invited to the feast and won't take their brand new bride with them to the feast? Who is this guy? who's not willing to take his beautiful, young, new bride to a feast. Uh, and so we, th these are false excuses. And so here they go. They all, verse 18, they all alike began to make excuses. The first said, I have bought a field and I must go and see it. Please excuse me. Another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen and I'm on my way to try them out. Please excuse me. Still another said, I just got married. Well, I can't come. The servant came back and reported this to his master. Then the owner of the house became angry and ordered his servants to go out quickly to the streets and alleys of the town and bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. Now these represent the Gentiles because the Jews did not receive the gospel, did not receive the Lord, and so he goes to the Gentiles. That's folks like you and me. Sir, the servant said, what you have ordered has been done, but there is still room. Then the master told his servant, go out into the roads and country lanes and make them come in so that my house will be full. 
He wants a lot of people in heaven. You get that drift? He wants a lot of people to be in heaven with him. So he says, verse 24, I tell you, not one of those men who were invited will get a taste of my banquet. Why? Because they had insulted him in the most, you, you might say, uh, insulting or in an in intimate way. And so what are some excuses that people use these days, common excuses that keep them from serving the Lord? And so I've just picked out a few for us to get started on this series tonight. And, and, and one of them is uh, that I can't see God. Simply meaning I'm not sure there is a God. I, I don't know if I can believe uh, that there is a God. Oh, really? Can you really not believe that there is a God? And when a person says that, here's what, what a person is saying. They are saying that they think that humanity, that they themselves are as high as creation goes. That there's nothing beyond a mere mortal human being. Isn't that a discouraging thought to think? And that there's nothing higher than us? That we are it? That we are the ultimate? That we are the epitome of existence? That there is nothing after us or above us or beyond us? Now it's true. Uh, that we can't see God because God is so wonderful and great and majestic that He is a spirit. And a spirit, of course, uh, is not something that is seen with the physical eye. So that's why the scripture says in John chapter 1, verse 18, no man has seen God. And yet Jesus said this. And he was talking about spirit and he was talking about to being born again of water and spirit. And he said in John chapter 3, verse 8, he said, now the wind uh, blows wherever ever it wants and it moves things around. And you can see the evidence of what the wind has done, but you can't see the wind. You can see the evidence of what God has done, even though you can't see Him. And yet uh, there are some ways in which we can see God if we really, really want to. First of all, there is creation. And let's go to Romans chapter 1. Romans 1. And read this very well-known passage here about how that we can see God in creation. As a matter of fact, the scripture says, if we will look, we can see Him. This is verse 18 and follow. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of men who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Since what may be known about God is plain to them, because God has made it plain for them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, His eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what He has been made, so that we are without excuse. In other words, He says, just look around. Look around at the universe. And see, the, and see the, the sun and the moon and the stars and the skies and the rivers and the oceans and the land. See all the things. See the plants and the insect world and the animal world. And see, see all these amazing things. He says, you are without excuse because God has plainly shown himself in what he has made. Will you recall back a few um, months ago, I did a series of sermons. Uh, I think I did three. Uh, called Seven Reasons to Believe. And I would encourage you to review those sermons if, uh, and even uh, get CDs on them and share them with other people because those are seven good reasons to believe, to believe in God. And so uh, God has shown himself by creation and then God has shown himself by scripture. As a matter of fact, if a person will read the scripture with an open heart and an open mind, here's what we learn. We learn that God has revealed himself to us in the form of Jesus Christ. We read in Romans, or rather John chapter 14, verses 8 and 9, that Jesus said, if you see me, you see the Father. In other words, Jesus was God in flesh. And we see how that he conducted himself. We see how that he, uh, 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 his, his attitudes, the way he handled uh, life here in this world in, in such a godly way. And so we can see God if we want to by getting to know Jesus Christ and we find Jesus Christ in the scripture. We can see God in humanity because the scripture says in Psalm 139, and I, and I would encourage you to read the whole chapter. There's a lot said there about God, how that he's omnipotent and omniscient and omnipresent. 
But he also says in that psalm that human beings are fearfully and wonderfully made. You know, um, I've been impressed with how many doctors that I have found, I'm talking about medical doctors, that I have uh, become acquainted with who believe in God. I've been impressed by how many doctors believe in prayer before, like if they're surgeons, uh, they, they encourage uh, uh, people to have their preacher to come in and pray with them before they have, because doctors have this wondrous sense of the amazing, uh, 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 this thing called the human body, this machine uh, that no doctor, maybe a doctor can repair, but no doctor can create, and, it's, and they are amazed. And they, they have this sense that there is a creator that has made this amazing, amazing body. The scripture says in 1 Thessalonians 5.23 uh, that we have body, soul, and spirit. Talking about a human being. Body, soul, and spirit. We are three-dimensional. And so I'm saying this. Saying we can't see God can be an excuse, but it's not a legitimate excuse. It's not an excuse that will work on judgment day. You can't show up at judgment day and we're all going to be there and say, Lord, um, if you don't mind, uh, 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 give me a pass because I never could see you. You think that'll work on judgment day? When we've been exposed to all the, the, the evidences that God is alive and that He's real and that He is keeping us alive and that He's not very far from us. Uh, Acts 17, 27, that He's near us. Jesus said, if two or three of you will meet together in my name, I'll be there with you in the midst of you, Matthew 18, 20. And so uh, you can try. I can't see you, Father, but you can't get by with it. It won't work. And then um, there are people who use this excuse. I can't trust the Bible. Who wrote the Bible, they'll say. And sometimes they'll do it with a sort of, a, you know, skeptical smirk on their face. Well, uh, you know, uh, 40 different individuals wrote the Bible. But the scripture says that they wrote the Bible because they were inspired of God to do so. Let's read, uh, this is what would be 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 and following. All scripture is God breathed. And is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. So that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. And so that he says all scripture is God breathed. Now the Bible was written over a period of about 1500 years by 40 different writers. Most of them never knew each other. They didn't live in the same century. They never schemed and plotted and planned. But it's amazing how that all of them, uh, what they wrote, because they were inspired by the Holy Spirit to write what they wrote, all of them followed the same theme and agree in the same way. Talking about the great God, the Creator, and how that He is a God of great love and mercy, and how that He loves us, and He's kind to us, and He wants to save us. As a matter of fact, if you will take all the Bible together, you will see that there are these common threads and themes that go throughout the Bible. First of all, someone is coming. That's the Old Testament. Someone is coming, meaning Jesus. And then of the Gospels, uh, the theme is someone, that someone is here. And then the rest of the Bible is that someone is coming again to take us home. And so it's all about that someone. And that someone is Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And so the Bible says in Psalm 119, verse 105, Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my pathway. And here's what this means. It means that if we will live according to the Bible and what the Bible teaches us, and if we will learn to rightly divide the word of truth, that's 2 Timothy 2.15, which means you don't get mixed up and, and try to live under the law of Moses because that's been nailed to the cross. So we don't live under the Old Testament system. You live in the, we live in the Christian age, and, we, and, and as Christians we follow the teachings of the New Testament. And, but if we will follow the Scripture, the scripture will lead us nowhere except to the pearly gates. The Bible will not take us anywhere else. The Bible is lifting us up and making us better people. It makes us better husbands and wives. 
parents and children. It makes us better neighbors. It makes us better citizens. Everything about the Bible improves the station of man. And so we need to respect. Jesus said this in John 6, 63. He says, the words that I speak to you are spirit and life. And then this is 2 Peter 1, verse 20. Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation. For prophecy never had its origin in the will of man. But men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. By the Holy Spirit. And so the Bible, the scripture is spirit breathed. It's from the mind of God and the heart of God. And it is the word of God. And you can trust the Bible. And, and I know that uh, there may be people who will say, yeah, but the Bible's got contradictions in it. No, it doesn't. Uh, there, there, there may be some things that we don't understand because we haven't studied. But the Bible does not contradict itself. Don't let people tell you that the Bible contradicts itself. Because it doesn't. There may be some issues that are a little bit hard for us to understand because of maybe some translation uh, issues and problems. But if, if you will stay with it, you will figure out and find out that there are no contradictions in the Bible. The Bible agrees with itself and supports itself. The New Testament supports the Old Testament. The Old Testament supports the New Testament. And everything that the prophets prophesied, uh, you see fulfilled in the New Testament. And, and everything just works together in, in such an amazing, wonderful way. And so there are no contradictions in the Bible. And by the way, if you find a few things in the Bible that you say, I wonder what that means, and I don't understand it, how does that work? Listen, just hold up on that and go ahead and obey the things that you do understand. If you will obey and, and believe and trust the things that you do understand, you'll be on a spiritual journey that will help you to understand some of the things, perhaps in time, that are difficult for you to understand right now. Somebody else might say, but the Bible and Scripture uh, doesn't support science. Is that right? That's not right. The Bible is always accurate scientifically, even though it's not designed to be a, a, a science book. It's not designed to be a scientific document. Science is a discipline of man. But God is the ultimate scientist. He's the one who designed all the systems that, uh, that human scientists study. And so there's nothing in the Bible that, that denies any kind of science at all. As a matter of fact, it's going to support science in every way, even though that's not its purpose. The Bible is not designed to support science, uh, which is a human discipline. Um, just recently, uh, this guy, Bill Nye, was uh, on uh, uh, an HBO show. I didn't see it, but I read about it. And he was smirking around, you know, and laughing. He says, Christians believe that there are two sources of light. That there's the sun and there's the moon. And he's smirking around like that, you see. And, and he actually thinks that we believe that the moon is a source of, it creates its own light. That we don't understand that the moon is simply reflecting the light from the sun. He actually thinks but that we believe in this that because we don't understand some of the Genesis says. And this guy is a smart guy. He's so smart that he's stupid when it comes to things like that. The Christians don't uh, disregard science. Somebody says, but you can't trust the Bible because it's not historically accurate. Is that right? No, that's not right. The Bible is always historically accurate. And, and the more archaeology we, we, uh, we engage in, the more things we dig and find, we just keep on finding that the Bible is exactly right. What the Bible said, this king did live in this, this particular year, in this particular century, in this particular place, and the Bible just continues to be exactly right in every way. And so don't let people lead you falsely to believe that you can't trust the Scripture. The scripture is the one thing you can trust when you can't trust anything else. And if we go by what the Bible teaches, then of course the Bible is going to take us all the way to the promised land. Well, that's enough for now, but we're going to get to some more of these excuses in time. But notice, if you will, at this moment, the plan of salvation for those who have not yet become Christians. And so, uh, if you are not yet a Christian, but you want to be, you want to have your sins forgiven, you want a relationship with God. You want to be a member of His family, which is the church. 
and you want to go to heaven when you die, then just know that God wants you to be saved, 1 Timothy 2, 4. And in order to do that, we must hear the gospel of Jesus, Romans 10, 17. Believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, John 8, 24. Repent of our sins. That means make a conscious decision to turn away from sin, Luke 13, 3. And confess our faith that we believe that Jesus is the Son of God, Romans 10, 9 and 10. And receive baptism for forgiveness of sin. And then be committed to remaining faithful the rest of our days. And the Bible says, if you'll be faithful, God says, I will give you a crown of life, which means you will live forever with God in heaven. If you're a Christian already, but you need the prayers of the church for some burden in your life, then you'll never find a better time than right now to come to the Lord for any reason. If you need to, come now while together we stand and sing.